Welcome to Electron Line. Back in the 1950s, scientists began to try to duplicate how life may have started. And so one of the experiments, probably the most famous experiment, is what we call the Miller-Urey experiment. So both Miller and Urey came up with this idea to try and simulate the early conditions of Earth and then provide chemicals, put them together in a fashion that might resemble how it may happen on the Earth. And of course, he's using chemicals that are readily available in our solar system, methane, water, and ammonia. And of course, a little bit of energy or heat. So what he did was he had a flask where he heated the water inside the flask to produce water vapor. He then mixed the water vapor with added gaseous methane and ammonia. He would mix all that and that was driven then into another flask where inside the flask we had sparks produced via a battery or power source. And then we kept that experiment happening for about a week. We would then channel that, that mixture that was sparked back into the flask, back into the flask over here, back and forth. And we kept that experiment going, not we, but they kept that experiment going for about a week. As the days went by, a dark mercury solution began to evolve in here, began to appear, not evolve, but appear, I should say. And so then when they, did a, when they finally finished the experiment after a week, they went in and looked at what, they, what it contained within that flask, and sure enough, they found amino acids and other organic molecules. Now, that was earth-shaking at the time because we all knew that amino acids are indeed the basic building blocks to life. It's kind of like saying that if you have a pile of bricks, those are the basic building blocks of a house. So the difficulty still is that amino acids can readily be produced in any high school experiment. You just put the right chemicals together, provide some heat, mix them together, and you will end up with amino acids as well as many other uh, what we call organic molecules. That doesn't mean that that was really the proof that life can then form from that. It's like saying, hey, I've got a pile of bricks, therefore going from bricks to a house is just nothing. It's just an easy one more step. The still, this was that big gap that still could not be overcome. Amino acids are easy to produce, but it's not the amino acids that form the single, the very simple single cellular life. You need to have RNA, you need to have cell walls, you need to have proteins that are enormous chains made from the amino acids, just like you need walls and ceilings and glass and windows and all those other things to produce a house. So it was a start, it was a great start, I think it was a fantastic experiment. It did show that if you mix the right things together, you can get the basic building blocks of life, but it went a long ways from trying to show how you can actually go from here to life. That was the experiment we were really looking for that we really need. Great that we know we can produce amino acids. It's like, you know, you can produce bricks, but doesn't mean that you throw bricks in the air, you'll somehow end up with a house. Just because you throw amino acids together doesn't mean you come up with a single cellular life that is alive and functioning. So we still are a long ways from bridging that gap. Now, since then, other experiments were done. They began to realize that the the gases that they were using in their flask were probably not what it was like in the early and the Earth, early Earth's atmosphere. They tried to come up with a better mixture of gases that more represented what they thought was going to be the early atmosphere of the Earth. And when they did those experiments, they produced far fewer organic molecules. But again, neither they, that's neither there here nor there. It doesn't really matter how many or how few they produced. The question is, can we produce life? in a test tube, so to speak? And the answer is, we haven't even come close. We've produced bricks, we've produced amino acids, but those are simple organic molecules that can be produced in any experiment, anywhere, if you just put the right chemicals together. That doesn't mean that life could come from that. That's still the big unknown, the big question. How do we go from the basic building blocks to a structure that actually is life from non-living material? Amino acids are simple, non-living material molecules, how do we get to life? And so, even though experiments have been done, we haven't come close yet to bridging that gap. That gap is still there, and we still have to find ways to explain how life came about on the Earth. Is it not called spontaneous generation? Spontaneous generation. Hmm. 
Uh, I'm not familiar with what you're referencing. No, I think I used to call it spontaneous generation or something. That's what they might have called it. I, I remember hearing the term, um, but I'm not quite sure what that reference, what that was referring to. Maybe you could look it up and see what that is. Yeah, spontaneous generation states the life arose from the embodying from non-living matter. Okay. So that's the term that's causing the bridging the gap. So they call that spontaneous generation. So, yeah, that's one way to look at it. it that's really what it's all about. How do you go from non-living to living material? And that's something that we haven't been able to prove yet. Or not even just prove, but even theorize of how that might have happened. Still working on it. Maybe one day we'll figure it out.